let's take a look at oscillations. An oscillation is a repeated motion. So an oscillating fan is a fan which repeats its motion back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. An oscillating string is a string which repeats its motion. It vibrates back and forth and back and forth. An isochronous oscillation is a repeated motion which always takes the same amount of time. Isochronous comes from two words, iso meaning same and chronos meaning time, same time. So in order to talk about oscillations, and in particular we'll talk a lot about isochronous oscillations, we need to have a couple terms. One is period. The period is defined as the time it takes for one entire cycle of an oscillation to occur. The standard symbol for period is capital T, because it's an amount of time, and the unit is the second. Frequency is the number of cycles that's completed per time. So it's the inverse of the period. Period is the time it takes per cycle. Frequency is the cycles per time. The symbol for frequency is a lowercase f, and the unit is the inverse second, which is also defined as a hertz, hz. So period and frequency are inverses of each other, and because they're inverses, we can say that the period is equal to 1 divided by the frequency. Or if you rearrange it, you can also say that the frequency is 1 divided by the period. The amplitude is the maximum displacement from equilibrium during an oscillation. Now the equilibrium position is the position of the object if it were not oscillating. So the amplitude is the maximum displacement that the object has from that equilibrium position. The symbol that's often used for amplitude is x0. Sometimes you will also see a capital A, but we will tend to use x0. And the unit is the meter. If we use the example of an oscillating pendulum, then the period would be the time that it takes for the pendulum to complete one entire cycle of motion. Okay. The frequency is the number of cycles that it completes per second, and the equilibrium position is the location where the object would be when all of the forces are balanced. So in the case of the pendulum, that's the p position at the bottom, and the amplitude is the maximum displacement from that equilibrium position. Now, one type of oscillatory motion that is very common in the natural world is simple harmonic motion. Simple harmonic motion, sometimes called SHM, is oscillatory motion when two conditions are fulfilled. Number one, the magnitude of the net force on the object is proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. So the further you are from equilibrium, the greater the net force on the object. And the second condition is that the net force on the object always points toward the equilibrium position. So if you're displaced a certain amount from equilibrium, the net force is always acting in a direction back towards the equilibrium position. We can summarize these two conditions in a single math statement. But in order to do that, remember, the net force is proportional to the acceleration. If that doesn't sound familiar, just remember Newton's second law. F net equals ma. The net force is always proportional to the acceleration. So, if these statements about the net force are true, then these statements about the acceleration also have to be true. So using that idea, we can summarize the two conditions for simple harmonic motion as a is proportional to negative x. In words, that would be the acceleration is proportional to and in the opposite direction of the displacement from equilibrium. Now, this statement, a is proportional to negative x, we could write that a different way. We could say that a is equal to negative kx, where k is some constant. If this is true, then think about what the graph of acceleration versus displacement would look like. Well, a is equal to negative constant times x. So that means a and x are linearly related. This is a linear relationship. And if we look at that linear relationship, the y-intercept for this is 0. So if I were to plot a versus x, it would go through the origin. And also, let's see, if we think about this as a linear graph, then the slope of the graph would be negative k. So it's got a negative slope. So we should have a negative slope 
linear graph with a y-intercept of 0. So that would look like this. Now, for reasons that we won't explain right now, if we have simple harmonic motion, the displacement versus time graph would be sinusoidal. Sinusoidal means that it has the shape of a sine or cosine graph, although it can be shifted a little to the left or right. Now, if we know what the displacement versus time graph looks like, then using concepts way back when we studied motion, we can get the velocity versus time graph as well. To get the velocity from a displacement versus time graph, you look at the slope of the graph. So if we know the displacement versus time graph, we can figure out what the velocity versus time graph would look like, at least its shape. And also, if we know what the velocity versus time graph looks like, then we can get the acceleration versus time graph, right? Because the velocity versus time graph in that, the gradient or slope of the velocity versus time graph tells us the acceleration. Now, if we do that process, then notice that the acceleration versus time graph looks like the upside down version of the displacement versus time graph. It looks like it's been reflected over the horizontal axis. And we can explain that because remember, the acceleration is proportional to the negative of the displacement. The acceleration and the displacement are negatives of each other. So the acceleration versus time graph is just the displacement versus time graph with a negative in it, also multiplied by a constant. But the shape is just the negative of the displacement versus time graph. Another thing to notice is that the displacement versus time, velocity versus time, and acceleration versus time graphs all look pretty similar to each other. They're the same basic shape, just shifted left or right some amount. Now, when we shift a graph left or right like that, or if, when we talk about a shift left or right in a graph, for simple harmonic motion, that's called a phase difference or a phase shift. So if I have one graph that looks like this, very similar to a cosine, and then if I have another graph that looks like this, very similar to a sine, then the second graph looks like the first graph just shifted a little bit. And in this case, the amount that it's been shifted is one quarter of a period. So we say then that the phase difference or the phase shift of the second graph is one fourth of a period, t over four. Or we could also state that as the phase difference of the second one is one fourth of a period. Okay, let's look at a different example. Let's say I had one graph that looks like this, like a sine graph. And then I have a second graph that looks like a negative sine graph. So let's think about what the phase shift or phase difference is there. Well, the second graph is the first graph shifted by half of a period. So the phase difference is half of a period. And now let's look at these two. So these two graphs look very similar. The only difference is that they have different amplitudes. They have different maximum displacements. In this case, there is no phase difference between the two graphs. And in that case, when there's no phase difference, we say that the two are in phase. Now the last thing we will look at is energy in simple harmonic motion. And in simple harmonic motion, the energy moves back and forth between kinetic and potential energy. And to show this, let's draw a graph of displacement versus time and velocity versus time for a simple harmonic motion example. So let's think first about the kinetic energy. Well, an object has the most kinetic energy when it's moving the fastest. So that would be at the extrema in the velocity versus time graph. That's when it has the most kinetic energy. And then the potential energy, well, it would have the most potential energy when it's furthest from equilibrium. When it's furthest from equilibrium, that's at the extrema of the position, or excuse me, displacement versus time graph. And one thing you might notice is that when it has the most potential energy, it has the least kinetic energy. 
and when it has the most kinetic energy, it has the least potential energy. And it goes back and forth, from having a lot of kinetic energy and a very little potential energy, to having a lot of potential energy and little kinetic energy.